This is WTVJ, Miami, Fort Lauderdale. Live, this is News 4 Nightcast, South Florida's number one news at 11. Good evening. You can forget about American West Airlines buying the Eastern Shuttle for $415 million. Donald Trump's back in the cockpit with his $365 million bid. How does Eastern management feel about this turn of events? And how do you think its striking union members are reacting? News Force Joe Avalar is about to supply some answers. Go with this gentleman here, out to the bus. Striking machinists, pilots, and flight attendants continue to line up to picket Eastern Airlines, despite the bankruptcy court now allowing Donald Trump to buy one of Eastern's biggest assets, the shuttle. And although the, the sh we, we don't like having to sell the shuttle, it's absolutely essential to our survival and being able to build and, and grow the airline again. And it ultimately will be best for Eastern, for its customers, and the communities we serve. I wish he bought the whole thing, to be honest with you. Uh, I hear he's very good to work with. The other suitor for Eastern Shuttle was America West Airlines. They'd offered more money for the shuttle than Trump, but at the last minute, their financing apparently fell apart. And the striking workers didn't like America West anyway because that airline is anti-union. Donald Trump has agreed to keep the striking Eastern employees who work the shuttle. If the deal is sealed Thursday morning, the shuttle could fly for Trump in as little as two weeks. Eastern says this sale will help them reorganize as a smaller company. Striking workers say they hope this sale will mean someone else will buy the remainder of Eastern and put them back to work. Joe Avalar, News 4, Miami International Airport. A Delta Airlines jet was evacuated today in Denver after part of its landing gear collapsed just minutes before takeoff. The flight was bound for Atlanta and was preparing to push back from the gate when the collapse took place. The left side of the 727 dropped to the ground, damaging the wingtip. Passengers were a bit startled, but no one was injured. The Navy investigation into the deadly accident on board the USS Iowa last month has so far been inconclusive. But in an exclusive NBC report seen on Nightly News tonight, we have learned that the Navy is looking into a bizarre chain of events that could point to murder, suicide, and homosexuality. Sources close to the investigation told NBC News they are looking carefully at two accidental life insurance policies taken out by 24-year-old gunner's mates Clayton Hartwig and 21-year-old Kendall Truitt. Both named the other as the sole beneficiary. Hartwig was killed in the explosion inside gun turret 2. Now Truitt is trying to collect on the insurance policy. Navy sources have said the two had a special relationship that soured about six months ago. And the insurance company holding those policies has questioned Hartwig's sister about his alleged homosexuality. He was a loner, and I know that he only had a few good friends, but because of this, you know, it just doesn't make him a, a homosexual person. I, th that one thing has nothing to do with the other. Sources told NBC that Hartwig may have been suicidal, something his sister also denies. Navy investigators are also said to be looking at the possibility that Truett sabotaged the gun barrel by placing an explosive device inside a burlap bag, which is loaded between gunpowder charges. He was seen inside the turret the day of the accident, and one of those bags was reportedly found inside his home. Now, Truett is denying any wrongdoing in the explosion and is denying a homosexual relationship with Hartwig. He has, however, asked to be transferred off the Iowa, a request the Navy will honor, they say, to protect him from his shipmates. Speculation is rampant in Washington tonight that Jim Wright may be on his way out as Speaker of the House. None of the principals is speaking publicly yet, but sources close to the House Ethics Committee negotiations say that Wright's lawyers have proposed a deal by which Wright would resign his leadership post if the most serious ethics charges against him are dropped. Earlier this week, Wright insisted he intends to press ahead with his case, but stand by. Tomorrow may bring a change. Every day seems to bring something new in the Rob Lowe sex video scandal. Court papers unsealed in Atlanta today say the teenager who's allegedly featured in the recorded bisexual romp with Lowe and a second woman did plan to blackmail the actor to the tune of $2 million. That came from divorce documents of Lena Jan Parsons' parents. The now 17-year-old Lena Jan is the girl in question. Those court papers also allege that Tara Siebert, described as a known lesbian, lived with Lena Jan and her mother last summer and slept with Lena Jan regularly. Supposedly, Lena Jan and the 23-year-old Tara met Rob Lowe in Atlanta's Club Rio. This woman, whom we know only as Rebecca, claims to have introduced them. She says Lena Jan subsequently bragged often about sex with Lowe and the videotape. Oh, openly, completely openly, she uh, spoke of the tapes as the word nothing. 
Does Rebecca believe Lena Jan actually intended to blackmail Lowe? Not really. Maybe uh, by someone else's suggestion, maybe her mother. Still no word from Lowe himself on all this, though his publicity people promise he'll have something to say before the week is out. China's top army command has published a letter strongly supporting that country's prime minister, Li Peng. Li Peng has been in favor of a hard crackdown on students pressing for government reform, an issue that has virtually split China's leaders. A meeting of the leaders is set for Thursday when the issue could come to a head. Meanwhile, China has renewed its restrictions on television pictures being sent out of the country via satellite. Freedom! 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 Uh, uh. Chinese students in South Florida say they want the same things for their countrymen. Today, a group marched down Miami's Biscayne Boulevard carrying signs and shouting, Dump Li Peng. Taking a cue from their counterparts in China, the march was organized and peaceful. More than 100 angry Coral Gables residents gathered at a school tonight to plan their latest strategy to block the construction of an apartment complex in their neighborhood. At issue, 10 acres of land owned by longtime developer Emil Gould property he had been trying to develop for 23 years. The city of Coral Gables and residents of the neighborhood have managed to delay construction all this time, even though they have lost every court case and appeal. The citizens have now launched a new petition drive, but Gould's attorney says that this latest delay hinders the current construction effort. He'll do it, uh, go to court again. Beyond any doubt, the building's going to get built. The only question is whether or not they will succeed in their plan in trying to scare off the financing. If they do, then they're looking at personal liability for substantial damages. We'd like to have something that's going to be decent and uh, helpful and healthy and will protect the welfare of the people who live there. Traffic is a problem. The residents who live in an upscale neighborhood are also considering supporting another developer's project for the land, one that calls for fewer but much more expensive units. Now, for a different scenario, you've got something that belongs to somebody else. The question is, what do you do? Well, it's often answered by trying to put yourself in that other person's shoes to look at things from their point of view. Tonight, News Force John Crane wraps up our honesty test with another look at how some people react when facing such a dilemma. Susan and John, once again, we have planted the seeds of temptation. <laughs> this time, the honesty test concerns overchanging, you know, when a cashier hands over too much change. The results are somewhat encouraging, especially when compared to the wallet drop test we told you about last night. Not one of our ten wallets came back. South Florida flunked this part of the honesty test. Overchanging was the next test. Our hidden camera watched as 20 restaurant goers in downtown Miami were given an extra $5 in change. News 4 supplied the money. Diners supplied food for thought. Now, in all honesty, there's no accounting for those who didn't count their change or just didn't notice. But the woman you're about to see clearly noticed she got back $5 too much and didn't say a word. This woman also walked away with the money, only to return later, but not out of a guilty conscience. She was looking for something she left behind. But while many kept silent when overchanged, people were quick to speak up when mistakenly overcharged. No, no, no. I had a one-time suit and... Oh. I owe them $0.25. They know. They ask me, hey, you owe me $0.25. But when but they owe you over, money? They just put their pocket. In the pocket and away they go. <laughs> they go. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened with 16 out of the 20 people we overchanged. Elizabeth Jansen was one of the four who can stand tall. And you gave me $5 too much. Oh, thank you. A former bank teller, Jansen never even considered not giving the money back. I know what it is to be a cashier. And I know what it is to be short and out of balance. And also I was taught from the time I was little for my mom and also for my church to be honest. Also restoring our faith in humanity and politicians, Metro-Dade Commissioner Larry Hawkins, he too passed the honesty test. If I give you 20, you can't give me back 20. Oh, sorry. Thank you. If you're going to take, uh, whether it be $5 or, uh, if you know about it and you're going to take it, then you're going to take from somebody else some other thing. You're just not, I don't view you as an honest person. And I like to view myself as an honest person. 
Most people would say the same thing about themselves, but in our honesty test, as limited and as unscientific as it may be, most people did not do the honest thing. So John and Susan, does honesty pay? Well, mm -hmm. there are 26 people out there tonight who may be a few bucks richer, but you gotta figure those who return the money to us as something even more valuable, self-respect. That's and priceless. I, and our respect as well. Right, <laughs> and I'd like to thank uh, my producer, Tammy Leader Fuller on this series and the co-producer, photographer, Steve Schneider. Right. Thanks a lot. Thanks, John. Sure. Are we in for more stormy weather? Cliff has the forecast, plus a look at some of Mother Nature's gifts from this afternoon coming up next. Like then a bit later, we'll meet the members of uh, Miami's hottest new music groups, Clockwork, that is in Yolanda Gaskin's entertainment report. But first, Ned Smith has a sports preview. All right, coming up in sports, Tony Segretto reports from Gainesville, where the Hurricanes are preparing for the start of the East Regionals. And the California Angels have come east with one-handed pitcher Jim Abbott to battle the Yankees. We'll show you how he did later on the Nightcast. South Florida had another taste of Mother Nature's stormier side today. Hard rain swamped many roads just around rush hour, as luck would have it, clogging traffic and causing some minor accidents. Hail fell from the sky in some places, causing a few nicks to automobiles, but no serious damage. The heavy rain was still not enough to douse that big fire in the Everglades. More than 75,000 acres have now been scorched, and the flames are still burning. Earlier today, the fire was getting close to the Miccosukee Indian Reservation, but so far, all 500 residents have been able to stay in their homes. The question is, are we going to have any more of that kind of weather t tomorrow? If we do, it won't be as intense, and, but it will probably happen about the same time of day from the daytime heating. About you three know? Right. Yeah, 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 and I'm sorry I didn't get over those fires, too. The Channel 4 weather cam was out at the Miami International Airport tonight, and we were at the executive hangar, and Daryl Ward from Page Avjet was there with cam man Gary Montaneri, so he said, hey, how's the weather out there, Daryl? It's been raining cats and dogs all day today. It seemed to slack off now. It's a perfect night for flying. Come on down. Come on down. Thank you very much, Gary. It did clear out. We have fairly clear skies throughout the area right now. 77 in Miami. Miami Beach is 78. Kendall, 77. Fort Lauderdale, 75. Boca Raton, 78. And Key West, 79 right now. The barometer's rising. Relative humidity, 82%. The winds are from the southwest at 6. In the surf at Miami Beach, water temperature's 81. And in the last 24 hours, we had good air quality in Dayton Broward today. The record high for this state. We broke it this afternoon. It was 94. The record low, 67. The next sunrise, 631. And your next high tide will be at 12. 05 tomorrow. From Irving, Texas, the weather watcher tonight concerns this seven foot alligator. Feel sorry for this guy because of the heavy rains in Texas. He was washed into this small pond. It's called Lake Carolyn. It's right near an overpass. They've set traps. They've set traps, but still, he won't come near it. To be continued. To be continued. That's about it. Let's take a look at some of the rainfall today. Some private individuals, weather watchers called in with, you know, amounts up to an inch and a half and plus. But here are the official rain totals from this afternoon. Very, very heavy rain in a lot of areas, and we're glad to say it's over for now. Take a look what we have for the rest of the nation. We're forecasting the weather for tomorrow's cool air is going to be spreading across showers and thunderstorms from the Great Lakes all the way down into Texas again. New York will be clear. Washington's fine. Chicago, look out for rain. Dallas, Fort Worth, perhaps some rain in the area there. And out on the coast, Rain uh, just up around Seattle. That should clear by afternoon. San Francisco and Los Angeles, partly cloudy. Now, here's where we had the rain this afternoon. Watch. Boom. That little area of uh, unstable air moved through. It was like a trough in the atmosphere. So we're looking for clearing skies. Take a look at what we have for this evening right now. You're going to see partly cloudy weather. Temperatures mainly in the low 70s. And then for tomorrow, a very hot, steamy day with temperatures well into the 90s. Take a look at the five days ahead, Thursday and Friday, thunderstorms in the afternoon. Same thing for Saturday and Sunday and Monday. Partly cloudy with afternoon thunderstorms. Very slight chance, but watch out. 88 to 92, the high, low temperature in the 70s. And for the marine forecast, southeasterly winds, 5 to 10 knots, seas 1 to 3 feet, and the bay will have a light chop. So we'll see what happens again tomorrow. All right. Certainly hope so. Thanks, Cliff. Eight people picked the winning Fantasy Five numbers drawn last night. Six of those people were South Floridians. Each of the winners will receive about a quarter of a million dollars. Now, the next Fantasy Five drawing will be held on Friday night at 11 o'clock right here on Channel 4, your right. official right. lottery right. station. Right. Well, it's the night before a big game <laughs> for the baseball playing Kane. That story next in sports. But first, here are tonight's winning Cash Three numbers. Seven, five, four. Well, what's going to happen in about 12 hours? Well, we're going to throw out some pitches up at Gainesville in just about 12 hours. The first pitch of the East Regional will be thrown out as the University of Miami takes on Villanova in the NCAA baseball tournament. Tony Segretto is there, and tonight takes a look at the underdog Wildcats.
Villanova, Miami's opponent here as the East Regionals get underway tomorrow morning in Gainesville, comes in with the most impressive numbers of the tournament. A 357 team batting average. They score over 10 runs a game. A respectable ERA of just under four. But despite those impressive numbers, believe me when I tell you this, Villanova is considered the Rodney Dangerfield of this tournament. People have been knocking us all year. They rank us 48 out of 48 teams here in the regional. Um, they put a six seed. I mean, all the odds are against us. Even head coach George Bennett candidly admits the odds are against his team. Certainly, I wouldn't favor us if I were betting. Uh, oh, Peter, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's a comedian. But seriously, the big question mark hanging over Villanova is its schedule. In fact, they never played a team ranked in the top 25. These guys play against real good competition all the time, and we don't. Uh, if we were playing against the same kind of competition, I don't think there would be that much difference mm -hmm. in the two squads. But there is. And the Wildcat players hear what people are saying about them. Everyone's laughing at us. Uh, we'll see what happens tomorrow, see if they laugh tomorrow. If we win, we're going to be the Cinderella baseball like Villanova was the Cinderella basketball in 85. So, the storyline is set. Will Villanova find the glass slipper, or will the Wildcats turn into a pumpkin after game one against Miami? We will see, and we will have complete highlights for you tomorrow at 6 o'clock on News 4. Hey, we also have the Tonys at 5.30. It's going to be a big day. So until then, from Gainesville, I'm Tony Segreto, Sports 4. All right. For most of his life, California Angels one-handed pitcher Jim Abbott has gotten plenty of publicity because of his physical defect. But he'd appreciate people noticing his pitching, thank you. Abbott was in the Big Apple tonight and showed his versatility on the play, getting this bouncer back to the mound and then throwing out the speedy Ricky Henderson. Abbott left after five and a third innings with his team up five to two. Two of the runs coming, and this Wally Joyner double to center field. Looks like Abbott will pick up his fourth win of the year as California leads New York seven to four now in the ninth. Boston beats Seattle by one. Minnesota over, over Toronto ten to four. Detroit takes ten to beat Cleveland. Baltimore leads Chicago three nothing in the eighth. Milwaukee trails Oakland six two in the eighth. Kansas City over Texas six three in the seventh. The National League: Cincinnati beats St. Louis. Pittsburgh and Atlanta tied one one in the thirteenth. Chicago leads Houston 3-1 in the ninth. Philadelphia and L.A. tied 1-1 in the fourth. No score between the Mets and San Diego in the fourth. And Montreal is in front of San Francisco, 1-0 in the second. New York Knicks head basketball coach Rick Pitino has been offered the same position at the University of Kentucky and said he will make up his mind by Monday. Pitino, who's been with the Knicks for the past two years, says he's leaning towards taking the job. But there's one major factor that could weigh heavily in his decision. And it has nothing to do with basketball. My wife thinks it's a great place, except she does not look at moving favorably right now. And that's something we have to face. Is, is your wife the key in this? She's much more powerful than me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, at the NFL owners meetings today, Minneapolis was awarded the 1992 Super Bowl, beating out Pontiac, Michigan. Next year, the NFL showcase game will be played in New Orleans. And New Orleans is the final destination for our two canoers trying to break a record paddling down the Mississippi. The record is 23 days. Our two friends are currently on day 21. And according to our canoe gram, have traveled 2,100 miles. 200 to go in two days. They have until Friday at 1 p.m. to break the record. And we'll break that record that plays in the background as soon as they do it as well. <laughs> okay. I'm for that. We'll paddle on now. Uh, well, a hot Miami band with a Latin sound and occasionally a new beat. Will clockwork make it into the big time? Yolanda Gaskins has their story next on the Nightcast. The last Miami band to make it big, the Miami Sound Machine, did it with a pop salsa beat. Yeah, but now another Miami group is making it with a twist on that sound. News 4 Entertainment reporter Yolanda Gaskins is here with a look and a listen. I think, I think we've got another big hit, another Ooh. big band coming out of Miami. Tonight was the first album for the local group Clockwork. It was launched at Daphne's. They're calling it the Miami sound, but when you hear Clockwork, you'll discover it's a whole lot more. Although the music has a definite Latin beat, you can tell they're clearly aiming for crossover success. The whole world is ready for it because it's going to have not only that Latin salsa, but it's also going to have a lot of European influence. And 
as inspiration to local talent, let me remind you, Clockwork was signed while playing right here in Miami. They have had a great deal of success in Miami. Uh, they had Nostalgia was a song that they had out, I, I think it was uh, sort of independently, it was before they joined Polygram, it was a very big hit down here. Uh, it's part of their new record, new album, um, and it is um, beginning to perform quite well. The record business is a tough one, but Polygram producers have a feeling this one's going to be a biggie. They will be performing at Daphne's at Sheridan Dockside through June 17th. They're good, so catch them while it still doesn't cost you a lot of money. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you got it. Well, of course, this program doesn't cost you a thing. Thank you for having us in for news. We will see you again tomorrow. We're going to leave you with more music from Clockwork. Take care. <laughs>